Last week on Faith and Friends, I talked with Marcy Seidel of the Drug Free Action Alliance. And if you saw that broadcast last week, then you heard us talk about the opiate crisis in Ohio, what's causing it, what's growing it, and what the Christian people in our community can do to uh, support those who are in the situations, the families who are dealing with this, and what prevention issues are available. Well, this week we have a testimony of someone who has many of those answers because he's lived things that he probably never thought he would, but he has seen Jesus' restoration in ways that he probably never imagined could be possible. Russ Thomas, thank you so much for joining us this week on Faith and Friends. Let's just get right into your story. Tell us about what happened to you, oh, just a little over 10 years ago. Yeah, it was uh, March of 2004. My son and I were cutting out a tree at, at our home, and all day long I had been practicing the safe ladder techniques of climbing off the ladder onto the branch and cut off the branch. So that way if something happened to the ladder, I was still safely up in the tree. I used to be a volunteer firefighter, so I was trained in ladder safety. And I got in a hurry, the very last branch, I stayed on the ladder, cut the branch, and it came down and hit the tree and knocked it out from underneath me. So I ended up going down feet first. Uh, I hit a root that was sticking out of the ground with the outside of my right foot, and I ended up with a compound fracture just above my right ankle. So I had surgery that day and uh, ended up developing a staph infection mm -hmm. and six surgeries over a year and a half period. I was being prescribed 12 Vicodins a day for that period. I was a factory worker at the time, so it wasn't like I was in a culture of addiction. And uh, surgery number seven, they amputated my foot, partial leg, just below the calf. And um, so I was pain free they cut off my legs, so I stopped taking the pills and didn't understand the culture of addiction. Or I know there was a risk of addiction, but it wasn't at the forefront of my mind. And uh, after about three days of quitting the Vicodins, my stomach started to burn. My legs started to spasm into the night where I couldn't sleep. So I was new to amputa amputation, and I thought maybe it was nerve-related. People speak of phantom pains. Mm -hmm. So I took some Vicodin to settle that down and the pain went away and I slept well. And that process just kept playing out over and over again uh, to the point that I finally had to realize that I was a, a, addicted to these pills. But it was quite a while after that before I would admit to it. Wow. So we hear, I think the average person at home when they think of a drug addict, um, the picture in their mind does not come to be uh, a middle-aged factory worker with a family, but that is who you were and uh, yet, all of a sudden, addiction took a hold of you. Yes, I mean, anyone right now, uh, especially this time of year, if you're out cleaning your gutters right now, you're just one accident away from being an addict. So it, it can affect anyone. Like I said, I was 48 years old and uh, living my life normal. I thought I was cruising into retirement and uh, you know, I basically started a, a rebirth and a second life. <laughs> so everything's changed from what I thought it was gonna be. Did, uh, did things continue to spiral downward or were you able to just discover, hey, I've got this addiction issue and I'm gonna handle it. I'm gonna take care of it. No, I was in denial and um, I, didn't, I didn't want to seek help because I didn't really consider myself an addict because addicts, you know, they're living in the street and I had this vision and this judgmentalism about addiction, about addicts that I judged them and the addicts and homeless folks and I, I kind of considered they're where they are because of their own choices. And I nearly became both. Well, I was an addict, but I nearly became homeless from that situation because I started uh, spending money that my wife and I didn't have to spend mm -hmm. to keep the pills coming in because I didn't understand the culture of, of addiction. So I didn't know where to find these pills. So my first defense was to doctor hop. I started doctor hopping. I would go to dentists. I would go to back doctors, anyone I, that I could possibly uh, convinced that I had a, a pain from an injury or a, an illness that would prescribe me the pain pills. And over the course of that doctor hopping, it was discovered that I was doing this. You know, they have technology now that they can track these things mm -hmm. and they see patterns of abuse in people and they'll just cut you off. Um, I wasn't willing to admit that I was an addict, so I wasn't willing to accept any help. And for 18 months, I watched my pharmacist fill my bottle every month, so I knew where he kept them. Mm -hmm. They've developed better measures now to lock them up since, since then, but I knew where he kept them, 
and after uh, five nights of no sleep from withdrawal, which is torture, the pain from the withdrawal was worse than the amputation by a hundred wow. times. The, the stomach and the spasms were incredible. And so I understand what addicts go through with the withdrawal now and why they do the things they do because I found myself on the fifth night at 2 a.m. Um, about to break into Sweeterman's drugstore <laughs> in Wapak to uh, get the pills to get rid of this pain. At this point, all, all through this time, I was taking the Vicodins to gain something. Now I was looking for them to avoid something. Mm. You spend the first part of your career as an addict chasing things, and then you eventually start running from things. Mm. And that's where the, 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 the law breaking comes in and people are trying to get rid of the pain that they feel is why they, they break the law or why they steal from families. And that's where, that's where grace comes in. But that night it, when I was about to break into the drugstore, that's where I met, I met Christ for the first time. I mean, I'd been to a couple churches as a youth growing up with my folks, and uh, I knew there was a God, but he was up there making hash marks of my good and my bad, and if my good outweighed my bad, I went to heaven. If my bad outweighed my good, I went to hell. But he was a judgmental God, knew nothing about Christ. And um, I never met him in a church, but I met him before I broke into that drugstore that night. <laughs> So you didn't break into the drugstore. No. Is that correct? No. God stopped correct. you. Right. So did you, did you felt like you heard something? You felt like, uh, what was that point? Here you are, the, the addiction is pulling you in such a direction, yet God is stronger than the addiction. Obviously, you have that proof. Yeah. Um, you know, given messages out at the gathering place at our church, um, I always tell people that um, it's, it's not faith alone. There's... There, I have physical evidence of a living God and my transformed life is that. What I, the people who know me, what I was before this incident and what I am now, um, there's physical evidence of a living God for that kind of transformation to happen, for that kind of circumcision of the heart. You can't do that in the flesh and have it last 10 years. It's impossible. You would have eventually drifted back to who you were. So I don't believe that it's faith alone. God constantly gives us physical evidence of him through transformed lives. But that night, laying on my sofa, it was complete chaos in my mind, complete insanity to the point that I was going to commit a felony in all Glaze County, which would have put me in front of Mr. Pepple. <laughs> I'd still be locked up. So it was total chaos in my mind. But it was this, it was this voice of reason it wasn't audible. It was, just, it was just a thought process that I had, and it didn't tell me not to break into the drugstore. It simply said, this affects more than you. That's all it said. And what that did was made me think about my wife and my children and my grandchildren visiting me in prison. Mm -hmm. And that's what changed my path that night. It wasn't, there wasn't a disciplinary action. It wasn't a big, loud, booming voice amongst all this chaos. It was a soft voice. It was a voice of reason, but it still came through strong enough that it overpowered the chaos.